tuned in to Athletics Double LC yeah, 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 yeah. with Lamar, uh -huh. Lucius, uh -huh. Big League Chu, yeah. and my man Clyde. <laughs> you are about to be schooled in all things track and field. This is experience. Yes, sir. We are talking past, past present, present, future. future. Y'all listen up. Let's go. Hello, Athletics LLC community. There's an extra tile today. We're all lucky. So um, welcome everybody. Another fun week of Athletics LLC. Uh, joined by a fourth or an additional tile to the other three that are usually here with us. Um, so we will save our guests for last on the introduction. But Clyde, how are you today, sir? I'll Spartan down. Hour by hour. <laughs> I think Spartan Nation, stand more. up. Right? I love it. I love it. Uh, sir Lucius, how are you tonight, sir? I, as always, ma'am, I'm wonderful. Um, just happy to be in the presence of such greatness as my man Lamar and my man Clyde and our extinguished guests. So just right? happy to be I know. here. I know. Last but not least of the regulars, Lamar Ohana Huffins, how are you doing? I am doing fabulously. I, I'm currently experiencing a, a, uh, a, a, a non-road raging tour of the Midwest and uh, it's been interesting. Yeah, looks like you're just G-riding, G-riding in the Midwest. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think my, my loose count right now is I'm somewhere in the neighborhood of about 1900 miles in uh, like the last four days. That sounds miserable. Good job, brother. I guess, I guess. Got, but Got to outwork them, coach. Got to outwork them. Yes, sir. Sometimes you do. Well, last but definitely not least, I'm going to let him steal all of that rain and all that sunshine not in Lamar's screen. We have Coach John Smith with us. Um, how are you tonight, sir? Fantastic and improving. I love it, right? Oh, love See, that. Can, can everybody say that? Everybody has oh. to say that. Everybody yeah, can't and say unfortunately, that. they can't. They that's can't. the worst part. No. No. That is, man, that's that's tough, tough life. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your time and your presence, and definitely, obviously, all of your contributions to the sport. The three other tiles definitely have history with you. This is my first time speaking with you, but obviously, I do know who you are, or else I should be kicked off this show right immediately. Two years ago, I should have been kicked are, you, off. are your hands sweaty? They are, shush, to say that out loud. <laughs> I was saying today, I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. That's probably why I hurt my back today, because I was trying to do too much. <laughs> but anyways, but anyways, we'll get off of uh, my clamminess right now. But uh, so, <laughs> um, well, we have a couple questions for you, and then we'll let you just free flow for a moment and have some freelance questions coming. But um the three gentlemen have come up with some questions to ask you relative to what you do and what you are currently doing. Um, I'll break them up with a little bit of ad lib for you to uh, give to us, but in your great tenure of coaching, who has been the greatest trainer, so your practice athlete, and your best competitor, your meet actual competitive athlete you've ever had, and what made them special? Well, I would say I have to go back to when I first took the, um, I got hired at UCLA. Um, the, cover, the cupboard was bare. Um, they hadn't improved in the last couple of, last that couple of years. It was, it was 80, fall of 84. And um, my coach, Jim Bush, was retiring. And um, Bob Larson was taking over the, uh, the job and, and he hired me. And so I inherited uh, a group of, um, I guess it's ragtag band. Um, and I had to instill or learn to communicate or instill with them uh, a sense of what what practice is um, when you when you 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 got to come to practice to get anything relatively done um, 
you have to be at practice. That's where you le start learning. And once you get to the point where you really learn, now you are in practice. And in practice is a lifestyle. That means that you have a, a, a definite object, a, a, a objections, objective when you come to practice. You don't bring all the other stuff you leave your schoolwork at the at, at the, um, you know at the gate. You leave your social issues at the gate, and you 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 come for two hours, or two and a half hours, and you have complete control over what you want to do, and how you want to implement and and, and put in um, your psyche of what you actually want. To me, when you're in practice. You are, you are the student, you're the teacher. Um, and I always told people that the, the athletes teach me how to coach them. Um, we all have the same amount of arithmetic in our, you know, the hurdles are only so far apart. Uh, we got definite things like 100 meters, 400 meters, uh, 200 meters, 150s, 120s. You have all of this stuff. Uh, but how do you delineate it so that the athlete can benefit from it? You have, I had, I've had three definite quarter milers at one time. And the, 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 and a hurdler. But the key was each one of them were different and they approached things differently. And I had to separate them and I couldn't run them together a lot of times. But when I did run them, I ran distances that they didn't particularly like. So, you know, misery loves company. So, uh, you know, a quarter mile, it, 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 I looped on thousands during the fall, but during the, when we got to uh, January, we were on uh, 600s and they didn't like that because they, they, they liked sprinting. But I had to hold them uh, so that I could build that foundation. And that foundation, that's the grunt work. That's the stuff that you gonna wish you did by the time September rolls around because when the cupboard is bare, you wanna make sure that you can, if you got some fumes, you wanna make sure they got a high octane. And so I had to learn that first year on who to have, what I could do. And fortunately, everybody uh, uh, PR. Um, and so I said, hmm, so I, I can kind of coach. <laughs> and you know, and 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 I, I I got excited because when you go out on the track, you basically you have in your hands young people, and you're going to influence them. So I had to be real careful on what I was saying and make sure that I was building them up and not tearing them down, but also not allowing them to use excuses to get out of pushing themselves and, and so forth. So it, that, was, that was the thing that I did when I first started coaching. Now, who was my, um, the, the, the practice, the best competitor? They all were, but I can tell you, someone asked me, who's your favorite? I said, well, I can tell you, my first gold medal was Steve Lewis, and it happened to be in 400 meters. Um, and when he did win it, he whispered in my ear, and I'm, I'm being real, real short with it, but he whispered in my ear, and he said, that's for you, coach. And I boo-hooed, I was crying. <laughs> they had me on the jumbo, they had me on the jumbo and sold. And everybody was looking at me. I didn't realize that until later on. I'm like, oh my God, some big old crocodile tears coming down my face. But it it was, and I was hooked then because that feeling, I missed that in Munich. In Munich, I pulled up and I had to walk about five miles that night to calm myself down because I was like, what am I going to do? You know, all my life, I was my all my life, all my life. I'm preparing. What the hell am I going to do? Because I never thought about not getting the gold medal. 
that was just fixed in my mind. And, uh, um, and I had no idea, um, see from 72 to, to, uh, to 88, <clears throat> I had no idea that <clears throat> this was I was going, I was, I was going to do. <clears throat> I had no idea. And um, since then, each one of Danny Everett, Steve Lewis, even Mike Powell, <clears throat> Mike Marsh. Mike Marsh is an interesting thing because um, when uh, well, you just get to the, out of that, uh, all of them taught me how to teach, how to coach, actually. Because I hadn't gone to any science. I hadn't. You know, I was a political science major and, 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 and at UCLA. You know, I, I didn't think anything. As a matter of fact, before I started coaching, I was in the movie industry. I had no idea this is the furthest thing. However, when you are in, um, when you are in the movie industry, the one thing they teach you, uh, you have to learn. You have to learn how to talk to people, how to, how to position yourself so you you can get the most out of the character without uh, trying to read the audience. You let the audience make up their own mind. And you don't go in there like winking like this, and, you know, playing, no, no, you, you don't do that. You know, you, you, you do it to the point where it's, it doesn't even seem funny. They will laugh when it's funny. And so I, I, I teach and when my, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very animated, as you can tell, and, uh, and Chucky also would, would tell, I'm, I'm very animated, but when I, I, I'll take you to the edge of your emotions, and then I'll have some reconciliation, because I realized that you were pushing people, they're pushing me, I'm pushing them, and after everything has calmed down, um, then you can have a, a meaningful conversation. And that was extremely important because I never want to leave, have someone leave um, and calling me everything but my name. And uh, I've, I've, I've had that and I've messed that up, but I learned from that. I like it. I like it. I feel like your description of your acting or your, your movie business is what we do as coaches. It's like we try not to preempt what the workout is and how they feel some type of way about it. We get them there and then if they hate it, they hate it. If they love it, they love it. So I like that. There's a direct correlation. And and for for those watching, he is not lying. Uh, <laughs> John is not is not one for hyperbole. Um, when I was at UCLA under his direction, I, it's literally the probably the best moment for me as an athlete. He was trying to get me to do something extremely tedious while hurting me. And I didn't understand what he was asking me to do. And I didn't think I needed to do it. And I couldn't do it. And I was pissed. And he was pissed. And we got to the point where we totally shut down the track. Like the women's team stopped practicing because it looked like we were going to fight or something. We weren't, <laughs> but it was that loud. It was that aggressive. But the minute I left the gate, it was over. And we sat outside the gate and had a totally different conversation. And that's the type of human being that I responded to the best. And only that man at that time in the world could deal with me that way. Like I needed to be push to that edge and I needed to also be talked to respectfully. And so I understood that about him inherently and he kind of understood that about me inherently and it was it was great. Well, I, I will never forget that. It was crazy, but the best thing ever. You, you know, it's funny. Um, you, you, uh, you know, uh, Coach Bowler, Jeanette, mm -hmm. and she was sitting there and uh, <clears throat> I turned around. I said, well, get off the track then. He stood there. And I'm going on and coaching and stuff. I turn around. And he's still there. And, and Jeanette said, oh, John, I, I, I think he wants you to talk to her. 
I love that scene. All right. <laughs> That's but, funny. Uh, no one, no one on these tiles is surprised about that conversation. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Not at all. All right, so we're gonna get out of your feelings a little bit and and get get on the where Clyde might have put you that day. Um, do you believe the practice of the shoe companies forcing athletes to move to professional coaches um, has altered the sport, and is it harming the sport in actuality? Well, if you put, well, I've been on both sides. Um, I remember in 1988, um, I had, uh, well, without putting people to blast, I had not real successful Olympic Games. But they elected to go with uh, um, Santa Monica Track Club. And, um, you know, I sat on the side, I was pissed. And they were telling me, well, you can't, you can't get us to the next level. I said, you big dummies, you're at the next level. <laughs> and so I said, well, let me do it again. Um, 92. I did a repeat, got a world record, um, 400. And by um, world record in the 400 hurdles rather, Olympic record, but it changed again. And, and, and I kept losing as, as, a, as a college coach, I kept losing them to um, outside means because um, people were, were recruiting against me and we all know that. <laughs> um, so I had to make adjustments. Um, the shoe companies wouldn't even hire me because they didn't think I, I, could, I could do it. So I, I had to do it again in 96. But what happened, I started getting people from all over the world who were giving me props. I started working with Mario Barret from France. I started working with just, uh, and uh, Tony Jarrett and a lot of the Brits. And I was, I was, I was moving into a professional and making myself uh, a little different than, than a collegiate coach. I found that as a, as a college coach, and this is way back in the, in the early uh, 90s. Um, I never traveled with any of my athletes. I had my, my nephew travel with me. But I, uh, I was dedica dedicated to the school, you know, because then I, I, that's where I cut my teeth and that's where I was. I, I say UCLA saved my life because when I was uh, in school, you had the Panthers, the us, you had all of this social upheaval and, but the one place they never came, they never came to the track. So whenever they had any riots on campus, I went up there and, and, uh, and sat in the stands and watched all the fire, fireworks with the police and the, the, the guards and the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover and all of them come on campus. And I'm sitting up there just, okay, I'm gonna go work out because it basically saved my life. Um, so, my commitment to the school um, was insurmountable. However, the jealousy came and my, um, my co-workers, they didn't think that because my name became um, quite large um, because I had, uh, I had some, uh, um, I guess, leftovers from my competitive and I would walk around and I would realize that I got a memo one time and one of the guys said some hot shot coach out here you know I'm I'm like damn am I third person now and definitely pro now <laughs> you know, you know walking around here and won't wear all of the stuff and I'm like I'm not wearing that you ain't paying me matter of fact I'm volunteering basically you paying me uh, uh, slave uh, uh, 
wages. And I said, I had, I had my own car up there. When I went to track me, I, I put my own stuff on. You know, I had a hat cocked, ace deuce, had my nice shades <laughs> on, had me some loafers and no socks on there. I was dressed in pure white. I standing in that sun, you don't want to wear anything but white. <laughs> um, and I was a showman, but I was doing it with, with, with class and, and, and so forth. But not everybody liked my performance, even though I was bringing, um, you know, I was bringing stuff to the school. But the one thing I did, I never overrode Bob Larson because that was my boss. And I always wanted to make him look good. As a matter of fact, as I was um, coaching, I never, because I enjoyed coaching, I never wanted to go in that office and um, do, do, do paperwork because I knew that that was another skill. I did have it because I, I did uh, work uh, for Pitney Bowles. So, you know, I had been in the office. But there was a little red phone out there on the on, on the track that Bob Kersey and I, we used to do all our recruiting and stuff out there on the track and so forth. So we were running back and forth on the phone. I said, man, get off the phone. I got to make a call. He said, you going to have to wait. <laughs> but, so um, as, I, as I started growing and I started growing, I started attracting a lot of, a lot of people. So not only did I have UCLA, I had um, uh, all the open international athletes that were coming to me. And it, 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 it made practice interesting. Um, you know, we, 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 had, we had fun to practice. However, I never had them practice with my collegians because my collegians needed my, my full attention, just like the, 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 the professionals. And and so I had to make a decision. Well, no, a decision was made for me. You know, at one point I got to the point back and I, I had an issue where I wind up in the, in the paper. Um, it, 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 was some, it was some adverse publicity. Um, at that time, it was, um, we were going through a lot of stuff. Um, I think, uh, Puff and Puff is smiling out the side of his mouth, so he knows he knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> and I, and I, I may have, I may or may not have been there. So <laughs> no, you weren't there, but uh, you were there. <laughs> um, I got caught in the middle because that's when the FBI was all in everything, and then they were, and being a, my name was the big hit. They were trying to put me in there to get an easy slam dunk. I said, no, you know, no, I got an attorney and I'm, I'm not dancing with that. And eventually it got to the point where it was time. It was time for me to um, uh, leave the nest and branch out and, um, and start doing um, what uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm designed to do. Now, the shoe companies, I, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna talk on, on their behalf. First of all, when you, when, you, when you leave, when you're in school, you're in school for four to five years. You've developed that relationship with the school and you're with your coach. And, you, um, and your coach is like your surrogate parent, father or mother, which, whichever. So it's hard for a lot of the athletes to leave um, that, uh, um, that pristine environment. That environment is, 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 you know, it's very comfortable. Um, but sometimes um, you, have to, you have to leave the house in order to get some kind of response. I also, um, I remember Danny Everett and um, he ran well in, in 88 and, and even Steve um, and they were getting all these all of this stuff was coming to him. And I told him, I said, you gotta leave school. You know, I said, you're gonna stay in school, but you know, you gotta give up because you're gonna, you're gonna get everybody in trouble, including the school. And they did. And even though I knew I was, might lose them, I was still, that was best for them. Not for, uh, I, you can't be selfish 
And because what it did, it opened up a lot of stuff um, for me because I, ne I didn't have that, their responsibility on my, on my, on my heart. Um, there are some athletes that I would not, they're doing such a good job there in the coach like um, uh, Mike and uh, his namesake. Um, I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole because that, that relationship is so tight. And I remember Michael Johnson um, when he and Clyde and I remember going up to Michael, I said, I would love to coach you, but if you got something that's working, don't change. But John, said, but John, to that to to that point of the original question, right? I think that's kind of the the crux of the of what the question is getting at. Now, yeah. you know, Mike and Rye are doing really well with Quincy. Quincy's at USC. Okay. But if shoe company X decides that they don't like it anymore. We all know they'll force them out of there. Yeah. And is that reality harming the sport? Mm. Well, it depends if they go to the right place. Touche. Yeah. And, and I think that that's the issue. Like, right. okay, so let let since since everybody wants to dance around this, let me be the, be the renegade in the room and just call it what it is. Okay. So <laughs> I I am clear to understand that the shoe companies have a job and they pay. You know, people like yourself, your professional coaches in their minds. That's offensive to me as a college coach because if I'm not a professional, then I don't know what I am. But for me, to the, to the point we're speaking to, what we're seeing now is we, we back in the day, I don't recall that people were forced to come to places. You know, like some of the people you got chose to come there because they wanted to be great. They wanted to be get. They wanted, as you say, to continue to progress in life but what we're seeing now is people are being forced to go to camp x or camp y or camp z because the shoe company wants them with a professional coach but then you have these same athletes that are going to these these camps and they're not producing mm -hmm. so we have said this on the show before okay they want to create hsi the problem is john smith doesn't live in florida okay they want to create Santa Monica Track Club. Tom Telez don't live here either. So the issues we're, we're trying to get at is like, so to phrase it a different way, how do we get the shoe companies to see that there was, there's, there's something different going on with you and Tom that's not going on now? Because we got a lot of great young talent that's disappearing. Well, yeah, I, you know, I was, I was leading to that. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you broke the ice. Um, I'm, I'm I uh, <laughs> see you. I, I know. I know. I know your path that you 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 traveled. Uh, mm -hmm. You you were coaching um, elite athletes before you be, actually before you even graduated from from uh, from, from uh, Florida. Yes, sir. You, you and and we talked a lot. Mm -hmm. You know. I mean. I mean. I remember many times we were on the phone talking. Yep. You know. But see, that's why you are like you are. You reach out, and and and, and you too, Chucky. You reach out, and you get a a, a, a uh, some information. I, and I tell everybody, I can't coach everybody. I I, I want to share it. You know, I love it and seeing what uh, everybody's doing. However, there's the reverse on that. And we have some coaches saying, you don't want to go out there. And they may say they want to, you don't want to go out there and so forth, because look what's going on. Uh, and, and, and that's because they, they're, they're looking out for themselves. And like, I just tell everybody, I don't coach a marathon. Don't even come to me. You know, mm -hmm. um, I've had, I've been successful with a 400 hurdler. Um, and I could do it again once I have someone that buys into a program. But until then, um, I mean, people would even think at one point, well, he can't coach the 400 no more because I had all sprinters, you know, and Mary Jo winds up winning the goal in the four and the two, but they get, they, they, they pigeonhole you. And especially like now, like I'm not on the internet. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I go on there and look, but I'm not, I don't promote myself. 
because uh, my work will speak for itself. And I want people to come to me who want to be with me. And like you're saying, Miles, they want to be here. That's so powerful. If you want to be somewhere, you. I remember uh, I'm on the Chabot College up there in Oakland, and I was it was 1968, and I had to, they had the Quaker Oaks Junior Olympics, and I wanted to go up there. I flew up there on PSA, got up there at like six in the morning. The check in wasn't to nine. I rolled up in there, and I wanted to be there so bad. I curled up in the corner, wrapped my uh, my sweats that I had, went to sleep. I slept for uh, three hours, but I just come from the prom too. I slept for three hours, got up, won my race, got to go to um, uh, DC, and where I won the Junior Olympics. I ran on, I ran forty-seven nine, you know, and I met this guy. He handed me my medal. And he looked at me and he said, who in the F are you? That was Brooks Johnson. Uh, that, that very yeah. apropos. We all know it. We all know that conversation happened. Right. Now was that was my first introduction. That. Now, but, but what I'm, I'm let me let me what I'm saying, when you really want something and you want to be with someone, I used to drive from here. Uh, we were on a track meet, Chuck Smith and I would get up at 12 o'clock, drive from LA to San Jose, sleep in the car, get up, go knock on Bud Winner's door, get some, listen to all of his talk. And you talking about com uh, Comerical? Oh, this, this, he had stories upon stories. He would make some of his little drinks and so forth. We will go down there and uh, I forget the name of that park in San Jose. And we would just do drills. We would do drills and then I would, we would rush back on Monday and I would say, okay, let me just try this. That's because I wanted to do something. You know, with Leo Davis, I wanted to do something. You know, Leo didn't use a watch, but Leo had great success. I trained a year with no watch and ran my fastest time in the sprints because I started, let me just train like a sprinter. And I was training with um, um, Don Corey and had no watch. So I learned how to do train with the watch and so forth. However, you got to get with the right coach. And, and with me, I talk, if someone wants to come to me, I call the coach up. I said, hey, what, what, what do you think? Because it's just respect. And you know, I give my blessing or they give me their blessing. Now you can go forward with it, but just going through stuff and like you forcing people to eat steak and they're vegetarians and that's not going to work. There has to be a compromise where when you go somewhere and, and I tell, yeah, I tell Nike, I said, well, you know, um, let me talk to them. And we would sit down and have a conversation. And because I, I want someone that's here, because I'm not easy, but, but I'm on your side. But neither are those people who, who, um, who live in Tim Roofs, who, 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 who's a one of uh, 16 in a family. They don't play. They, they have no fear about nothing. For them to come to practice, oh, they can't wait. For them to do what they need to do, they can't wait. They don't have no back talk or nothing. And, and, and I, in, a, in America, we got to get back to that and respecting our elders and respecting uh, respecting the game. Because the game, the base of the game ain't changed. This is what they've done. They've thrown more money at it and put more lipstick on the pig and they're calling it everything but what it is. And we as coaches, you know, um, we have, <clears throat> we have to collaborate. I, I, I think in, in answering your, your talk, um, one of your objections, uh, Miles, is that we're all professionals. Every one of us. I think the NC2A um, 
did uh, call themselves amateur because they were doing their 501c. You got to keep that. But when you do a job and they pay you to do your job, you're a professional. You know, people that, that come in and, and, and uh, empty, get my trash out in front, they're professionals. You know, um, and, and we're starting to respect um, the, the, the professionals of all the healthcare because without them, well, we will be, we, 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 we all will be done. Well, I, I think you hit it. And, and we all know you to, to do this thing and play this game the, the way it should be played, the respectful way. I, I'm the youngest one here. You were one of my mentors in this thing. I grew up in this game under you. I don't think the game is the same. I think it's changing. I, I think the disrespect level on this issue is at an all time high. And personally, I think if it continues this way, if we don't get back to rational choices and treating athletes with the respect that they deserve, I, I think we're gonna continue to lose a lot of talents, a lot of our main talents, well, because we're trying to force you know, people into situations that they don't necessarily belong in or into hands that haven't actually earned the distinction. That's the key right there when and, Miles and, was talking about. But that, that's the thing that blows my mind. Like, last I checked, John Smith is still a working professional coach who gets paid straight up by Nike, but yet you got the smallest group you've ever had on your plate. Meanwhile, other people got 50 athletes. I'm like, how does this work? Yeah. Like, then, it doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> I, I like it like that. <laughs> you realize the, I, I wasn't that my... Uh, I went to the doctor and uh, you know, I had a colonoscopy, so he was checking everything. And then uh, he, he said, well, I'm gonna go through your throat. That's all right. And he said, man, you have a healing ulcer. He said, what you worried about? I said, nothing now. <laughs> and I started whittling myself down because, and, and, and what I mean by the game, you gotta come to practice. You got to do do what you're supposed to be doing. You got to do that, but the 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 greed makes the the game seem uh, it's secondary or tertiary. You um, people, I listen to. I was over in and in, uh, in Tokyo, and um, I was asked to talk to a couple of athletes and based on and their coaches were over there and I went to their coaches and asked them give me a little bit about such and such because I've been asked to talk to them would you mind no and they they came up and they talked to them before I even talked to them and it was funny because I said so um what's uh, what are you going to do um what's your what's what's your, what's your mindset and, and the first thing he said I just wait for I'm waiting for the highest bidder now, it had nothing to do with coaching. It had nothing to do with performing. It had nothing to do with the things that you need to do to create money that don't exist or never have. And that kind of mindset is what, what, is what having us to, and I'll just say this, we've had females that ran with those, um, um, ran with the Jamaicans. But they didn't want them, they, they manipulated it all and they went home. And we got to get back to the point. And a lot of it, some of it's shoe, um, uh, the, the shoe companies, but I think the environment, I know that the, now you guys got another thing at the universities. They can make money now. And right. they didn't have done anything. You know, you, 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 oh, and they can, if they don't like what you say, they transfer. You know, um, and this, this, you know, you, there's, there's freedom, but you got to have uh, restraints and uh, boundaries, I should say, not restraints. You got to boundaries. Because, you know, when I was coming up, uh, by the time uh, it got, uh, um, Nightfall, I had to be in the house. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't no like, oh, no, 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 you're in the house, it's nightfall. Um, 
we we have we have to get back to like our family unit. That's why I, I, I'm on a coach that treat it like a family. And if, when you, the reason why I said Chucky Shush, because when I have a big group, there's always somebody that's gonna fall off. Now that my group is smaller, I still have the same issue. However, I can, the people that are listening, I have a better command with it. And it took me, it took me one, two, it took me three years to get Michael and I on the same page. And, and it was almost like overnight. But once he did, it was like, well, damn, I, I've been saying this for three years, but, but now he's, he's paying attention. And then we were doing that. I did stuff with him I've never done before because what it did, it opened up my creativity that I could go and I said, hey man, let's try this. All right, you know, well, let's, let's do this. And then when I tell him, I said, well, you know, slow down. Now I want to do some more work. No, 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 no. So back up. But that comes from that trust that you have and so forth. Well, yeah. well let me let me jump in there because I because you're you're on a topic that, that we for sure cannot get to, cannot not get to with you. Everybody on this on this screen remembers a day not long ago when we were the dominant 400 meter nation. Yeah. Please pontificate from your perspective. How how did we lose that, and and how do we get it back? Because it seems as if the two best quarter milers we have currently. No offense to to Mr. Cherry. I mean, besides the one you coach, but the other two seem to be wanting to be sprinters. And, mm -hmm. and there's nobody behind those, behind them two and, and the one you got. There's not, we don't look at the group and say, well, this kid or this kid or this kid can run 43. So where, where has the U.S. being quarter mile or quarter, quarter mile or nation, where has that gone? Um, I'm based on, see, most of the quarter miles, you know, six, six foot. Uh, six three. They don't run indoors. Um, the the rest of the world doesn't. Karan James doesn't run indoors. I think the last time he did that when he was at um, he was at Auburn, Alabama. Um, yeah, Alabama. So he saved his legs. Um, if you notice, Cherry only ran one, and he did that because he was like, you know what? I'm tired of training. I said, well, go run. He said, I don't know. I said, you can run about 45 flat. Just go run. He ran 45, 24. And he shocked himself because of the work. And, and I wasn't doing any sprint work. What I was doing with him is I was teaching them how to run the event. See, we, we have to get back to teaching the event. And there are certain coaches that have a feel for teaching the event. I actually like teaching things like events. Like I go up to the 800 um, because that's that's right at the edge. The 15 is kind of like a little far for me, but I go up to the eight. Um, hurdles, that's the first event I coached when I was at UCLA. Um, the 400 hurdles is easy for me because you know it's, it's, you, uh, you got to just put some hurdles in the, in the 400 flat. But you got to teach them to hurdle with both legs, and because now you got that 45, 90, and some change, 94, he can hurdle with both legs. Um, the 400 is is not a sprint. Um, the 400 is a combination. It's it's. I remember there was a book called The Longest Dash. And when I was coming up with a 440 yard dash, which means it was set and it was the same group as the 100 yard dash, 200 yard dash. I even said the 800 dash too. People look at me, I'm crazy because I still think a 139.5 should be the world record. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm crazy and that's okay. Um, <laughs> but I, um, we need to get the kind of work that you have to do now. Because remember, um, 30, 40 years ago, I mean, you run 45 seconds, 45, five, you can win most races. 
um, you can't even get out of it. Uh, you can't get out of the first round. Um, we, we need to get a little more creative with the 400. Now, all I'm doing, now, you got two different kind of uh, 400s. You got a 2-4 and a 4-8. But a 2-4 is can beat that eight. But when you start going down to the 100, you start working, you're not reinforcing that energy system that you need to do. And see, I'm looking at sub 43. And sub 43 is, is a whole nother concept. It's, it's not about, it's a combination of speed, speed endurance and race knowledge and, and learning your, your, your particular rhythm. And that was the biggest thing. I know Miles said that he finally has learned how to run. And, and that's because every day I made him, I said, when he first got to me, I said, what's your race plan? I don't know. I just run. Okay. Now, I don't want to do that. And I said, well, if you want to be in the sport, you know, <laughs> I, I, th I suggested you start giving the race plan. I said, Michael, you are one of the most gifted people out here. But he had to get into an environment where that was reinforced to him all the time. You know, when, when you are a quarter miler, you ain't gonna be going out dancing and drinking and stuff with the sprinters. Matter of fact, a lot of sprinters can't do that no more either. Because, you know, you got the females running 1054, you know, Jet ran 1064, but now you gotta run 21, four, you got, you got now the, the females are starting to run, you got some low 48s. You know, it, they're starting to come along, but I think it was it was a gap. But uh, um, they they had fun this year. But see, Coleman's coming back. That shifts that whole thing. They better take the, the behinds back up to his respective events and then <laughs> run. And don't don't get it twisted. You ain't no sprinter. You're just a fast quarter mile. Because you get against Coleman, you're gonna yank your you're gonna yank your genetics right out of the socket. <laughs> Cone was a game changer. I think, I think what a lot of what I kind of saw this year with the 100 anyway was because Coleman wasn't there, everybody thought they could win. You know, the sure. moment Coleman got his issues, everybody else was like, oh, shit, oh, shoot, he's gone. I got a chance now. Yeah. Right. So they're not, that's what you saw. Right. And I think, and for the life of me, I can't figure out why people aren't saying, because, you know, clearly LaShawn is not LaShawn anymore. Karani right. is not Karani anymore. No, nope. not sure what's going on with Wade. So why is it somebody saying I'm going to take the 400 by the by the Nats and choke it the way everybody wants to choke? And I know the I know the money's in the one, but think about it like this: we've got six or seven guys in the United States that run sub 990 now. Like right now, six or seven guys with PBs at sub 990. Mm -hmm. That gets that's getting there's there's another one coming. There always is. Oh yeah. But as far as guys that have run 43 seconds, there's three of them, and two of those guys are the, the sub-990 guys. Yeah. So I think that that's at some point in time we got to address how do we get back to being – I mean, you know, I'm, I'm good friends with Andrew, Andrew Val, and I think his PR is 44-20-something. He never made a team except for a relay. I know. Right? You know, now if you run 44-20 and the guys in the back of the room going, I want a contract, I need to find an agent. Right, and forty four twenty is not fast. It's not. You know the kind, the kind of work that that um, um, Andrew did. Mm -hmm. um, he 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 wasn't the most gifted as far as speed and so forth. Andrew, when you got into a race with him, he, he didn't play because he's coming with it. Because and his training exemplified. And you know, Brooks and I used to talk about his training and so forth. That man was a beast. Um, the the quarter milers today, they don't want to do the grunt work. I mean, I I, I was telling um, uh, Cherry, I said, Cherry, I, I used to run, I used to go on a five mile run, man, uh, back in the seventies. I used to. Um, um, you know, we would run three 500s and step it down 66, 64, 61. Um, coming by uh, the four at the last one, like about 48, 49, but you got used to it. I mean, I didn't come out, out the gate doing it, but 
I think they become afraid of the, the training and they don't realize that you got to take your time and practice. And I think some of the coaches um, don't uh, understand how to bring people along. Let, uh, let, let me interrupt you for one second. Uh, do they not do, is it, is it an understanding or is it a knowledge problem? Because I think in my opinion, anyway, we, we got too much science involved in the floor. I totally and agree. We got away from the, the, the grunt. Right. You, you, I, I tell them all, well, I, I won't say the names, but you'll get my drift. Um, I had someone say, well, you know, this person says this, they're real scientific. You're not scientific. I said, really? I said, so I spouted off some BS and so forth. I said, did you understand what I said? Well, no, that's my point exactly. And you're absolutely right. Scientists don't coach. Coaches coach. Coaches coach. I will go up against a coach, a scientist, and a man. That's why I have fun with, with Ralph. Because, you know, I've known Ralph, we, I've known him since high school. And, you know, I said, oh, man, you hide behind that dog on a PhD. I said, I used to drop your butt off and you, I had to put a blanket over you so you could recover. And we laugh about that. And, and, and Ralph, you know, he, he, he sits there, um, but he says, I'm not a coach, I'm a scientist. So you can't hurt my feelings. <laughs> and I'm like, no, but I know how to get to you. But um, I just talk about John Akibor. Um, <laughs> but, you see, um, and I, I think that, you know, that's the thing that, you know, we're all trying to figure out right now is how do we get back to being that dominant? I, I personally feel like, and this goes back to the shoe company question, is that you know shoe companies are putting people with people, and I, you know, I don't sit in those rooms, and I don't know why. Some of it doesn't make sense to me, but the, the, it used to be like you kind of had to earn your stripes. Yeah. And now you get somebody coaches one person to run fast, and now they're an expert. And none of us can understand that. And, and to, to speak to, to my man Clyde's point, even if they don't want to send people to you, why don't we, would you, if obviously if, if they paid you to do it, and I know the answer to this, but I want you to say it. If you're a paid consultant for younger coaches, doesn't that help us get better versus people out there trying to say, hey, let me find somebody that's younger that can beat John that knows not half of what John, you've forgotten more about track and field than some of these cats will ever know. So instead of sending people to camps where they can't get better, why not pay you to mentor these younger coaches because we're falling off the map. You know, and we talked about this a little bit before, the world's coming to our house in about a year, less than a year. Oh, yeah. It's gonna be bad if we don't do something to get better. Cause see, I'm gonna tell y'all this and I'm privy to this because I, I'm not ashamed. I have no problem picking up the phone and calling John Smith and going, hey, uh, what do you think about this? You know, yep. We talked about that before with people having mentors. So I guess my question to you is if, if a shoe company came to you and said, we're gonna pay you, you know, heck, if USA Track and Field came to you and said, we're gonna pay you to mentor young coaches, what's your thought on that? Well, I was going to get back to that because all our, all our counter federations, first of all, let me just go this. It's a damn shame that the, we don't get paid no money for winning medals and stuff. They give it, I can't, this tier one, tier two, protect the <laughs> stuff. They give them the damn money and they don't have to be accountable to go get someone to coach them. There's not a, in a database, if you've got that kind of control, why don't you, and this is another subject, why don't you just make them, if you're gonna give money, part of it comes with, all right, here's a proven coach, you know, check it out. If you as a track and field paid me, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Matter of fact, I, a matter of fact, uh, I told them, I said, why don't you set up a program to have somebody come shadow me and I would do that. Well, exactly. You saw how that did. And, and that's why I, I got Tori, <laughs> uh, 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 K. Ron, 
and so forth. I just said, come on, uh, Jet. I said, come on, you know, because of my, and they know how to coach. They just never did it. And now you can see all of them are starting to flourish. And then Jets you know, coaching. I can tell you that. Jets yeah. coaching. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Jet, yeah, Jess, Jess on fire. Yes, she and, is. And she she got that. Um it, it, I just tell her, I said, uh, slow down, grasshopper. <laughs> slow down. <laughs> and and, and, and I think that the, and I think that's what we're looking for. You know, we we've we've got to find somebody or somebody's that can guide. Cause like, look, life happens. You know, you're not gonna be around forever. Um, Brooks is not gonna be around forever. The George Williams, the Clyde Hearts, the, you know, uh, Tom Telezes. You know, if we don't put you guys in a position to help the younger faction, the USA track and field's in big trouble. Yeah. And because you know, and, and another thing to, to that point, the 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 CEOs, I call it the suits. See, it used to be, remember Ernie Stripes? It used to be you, you're an athlete, you moved up, you got your degree, you go in the company and you do something. That's why Wisconsin was so doggone good, is because the football coach was turned out to be the athletic director. That dude was bad. It, 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 the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. The same with Oregon. The head coach wound up being the AD. And it, it went on. But then now all of a sudden, you know, you have to have this business degree. You don't know nothing about sport. And you in sport, it's about people. And you can't run it like it, it, it ain't run like an IBM where you have inanimate objects and stuff where, okay, well, we're gonna get this bottle right here and we're gonna slap a little label on there and make it a little different and then go. No, human beings. And some of the um, the things that we can and can't do, can and can't say. Um, uh, it's, it's all pigeonholed to, to really morph ourselves down to where we can't teach anymore. And I, I, we've had people to abuse it. And, 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 it, and it, it hurts us because they're not in the sport anymore, but we're left picking up the pieces. Mm -hmm. But to your point, that's why we sit and we have, we talk, yep. you know? I mean, I'm just talking, me and Brooks, we talk. Um, when something goes good, hey, nice job, man. Yeah, shit, I love that. I mean, I'm excited. I get chills. At 81, I mean, I had to get up and go outside. My knees are bad, but I was running on them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because, see, I remember when. Yes. You know, I remember when. I remember when Jet would call me up, what do you think I ought to do? Blah, blah, blah. I said, how does he handle this? Or how does she handle that? And I said, do less, not more. And, you know, same with Quincy. Quincy would have, I said, less is more. You got the genetics, don't, don't break it. And, and that's, that's the main thing. You can't read the East German stuff back in 36 and think that you can do it here today. No, we are genetically put together. And as you can see, the East Germans and the Russians are having issues with I can see, I always judge a, a country based on what kind of quarter mileage you got. You know, even a school, what kind of quarter mileage you got. Oh, they got a bunch of sprint. No, 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 no. Because a quarter mile can run anything all the way up to eight and back down to the one. What kind, what's your program? It can't be all jumping off boxes. It can't be all sprinting. It can't be all, it can't be, it has to be a combination of everything. And it has to be put in its right place in order to get the best out of the athlete. And you can't just go out and do slow. Sebastian Cole's father said, uh, LSD, long, slow running makes long, slow runners. You gotta have a combination of sprinting in there and move it around that's specific for the event. And at the end of the day, there's endurance and specific endurance, whether it's lactate, whether it's strength, whether it's speed, people put fancy names to it, but it's all based on, and it has to be a combination of even long jumpers. I look at long jumpers, oh, well, we, we, don't, we don't go around the track. Oh, really, do you really like Booker ran 10 for uh, 24? 
um, I used to train with Bob Seger. Bob Seger ran, when he was at SC, he ran 51-3 on a dirt track at the Coliseum for 400 hurdles, him and Jeff Vanderstock. And then he goes out there, he was a world record holder. John Pinnell was a 9-5, 9-4 sprinter. And I could go on and on and on, but speed is the game. And, 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 the, and when you're doing long jumping, triple jumping and pole bump, not only you have to have speed, you got to have endurance because you're going to take that two days in a row. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to go back to conversation I had, you, Bobby, and Brooks, and Eugene, Oregon, way. I'm, I'm not going to tell you the, the date because it'll date us, but. <laughs> That's okay. I'm 71, man, so. Yeah, yeah. And as, I, as I was transitioning from high school, in, in the, into the college ranks. And even when I was trying to be a better high school coach. So the, you've been mentoring me in some ways since I was a high school coach. And I remember the thing you said to me was, you can't run the rounds if you can't go around the track. Yeah. You know, and, and that stuck with me. And I think that's something that a lot of folks have gotten away from. And I agree with you that there is some short term to the short stuff, but the long term requires your ability to go around the track. You know, like I, I had a conversation with Alan Johnson. We did, I should say. And I, we asked him about his longevity. And the first thing he said was, the, my longevity had a lot to do with the fact that I had a 400 meter base. Yeah, he was 400 meter. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he was that before he ran the highs. <clears throat> and, and he was a high jumper. If, if we're dating, if we're dating ourselves as, as the young one here, I still get to do that from time to time. Right? We, uh, <laughs> I, I, met, uh, I met this man when I was 18 years old and I've been privy to, to these type of pearls my entire life, basically. Yeah. It, this, this man is my track and field so, father. So, so you've known him for like six years because we know you're only 24. Right. I just turned 40 this year. And, <laughs> and, I, and, I, will, and I will always say I, I am a proud member of that coaching tree and fortunate to, to have learned from him. And everybody so, so, so I want to do to you what they do to me, okay? So I'm going to just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a phrase and I just want you to give me a name, okay? Extrapolate. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ready? Best starter. Mel Pender. No, no, no. That you coached. Oh, that I coached. Yeah. Um, John Drummond. John uh, Drummond. No question. Yes. <laughs> um, best accelerator. And Maurice. Maurice Green. Best. <laughs> best 400 meter talent. Steve Lewis. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm gonna what who what was the guy? Okay, describe this guy in two words. Henry Thomas. Why well, see? <laughs> Henry Keep it clean, keep it clean. <laughs> oh no, 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 I am. <laughs> you know, my heart was broken to him. I know. Um, That's why I ask about it. <laughs> God given. Yeah. But you, you, know once told, you, you once told me he might have been the most talented guy on that team. And it was and there was another one that I was trying to get my hands on. Clinton Davis. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> he and Henry were the same size yeah. and the same profile. You see, we, we're gonna I think the EP talks about us. We're gonna do a show about, you know not kind of a where, where are they now, but guys we wish would have not had mishaps. Clinton Davis got to be on that list, EP, but oh, he yeah. helped in your coffers there. So Earl I'm Jones sure. is another one. Okay, so you talk a lot about the maintenance phase in the 100. Who's the best guy you've ever coached at the maintenance phase? It had to be Maurice. Okay. What about females? Oh, yeah. Okay. Those are too easy for you. Most frustrating athlete ever. Well, I, I'm talking about maintenance. I remember Maurice, I had all in cocky, all get out. 
we were in the world championships in 99 in uh, Seville. And he kept messing with the start. I said, why are you messing with your start? Oh man, I gotta give these guys a chance. <laughs> For a what? I gotta give them a chance. Cause you know, I'm, I'm like, I said, man, do you know who Bruni Cern is? I said, he done run 644, four or five times. Yeah, but I've ran 30. I said, I don't care. He wasn't in the race. And he kept messing around with the start. The finals came. And this is when I knew he 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 finally got it. The gun went off, he stumbled, Bruni went bam. And I just, you know, usually I'm like talking to myself. I just folded my hands and I just sat there. I said, all right, take your time. I'm just saying, take your time, take your time. And he did. And he said, he took his time and Bruni got to about 80, 80 meters and had a little glitch in his giddy up and Mo pulled right up next to him and went by him. And I looked at him and I said, now, he said, yeah, I didn't win that race. He lost it uh, because he had me. And I said, yeah. I said, but your discipline. He said, yeah, I won't do that again. So that's, but his, his maintenance phase, because he had 0 .85, 0 .85, he strung together 0 .85, 0 .85, 0 .85, about three segments. And then he had like 0 .9, maybe 0 .88 at the end. But from 60, 70, 80, he had 0 .85, 0 .85. He never ran 81s. Uh, he ran 1170, to put it in uh, meters per second, 1170. Um, 1177, never ran 12 meters, but he could string together uh, more of those seconds than anybody. And, and in a hundred, that's what you teach. I watch a lot of them and, 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 and they, they're running. And this is why the quarter miles are beating them. Um, they're running and running and running. They don't realize that, dude, you just got to realize there's some science, or there's, some, there's some physiology that you, you're not going to disrupt. You're not going to run 100 meters all out. There is a point. And when, I, when I'm teaching it, the reason why I came up with reaction time drive phase, um, no, re, uh, reaction time block clearance, uh, drive phase, transition, max acceleration, maintenance, and then see if you can el eliminate deceleration. But that was my concept because when I first started coaching the, the 100, um, I said, well, let me take what I do as a quarter miler and put a race plan in there. And so people were always, and I remember coaching the hurdles. I did the same thing with the hurdles when I had Jason. You know, you, 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 have, to, you have to have a plan. You got to be mindful of what you're doing, not mindless. You can't overthink something. But when you're running, you are feeling your way down. Because in the hurdles, you 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 got some inter you got a, you got some interruptions that you're going to have like ten barriers. In the hundred, you the the, the 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 feeling of running um, you have to know where you are on the track at all times. And I watch a lot of these 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 young kids go, and we have some nine seven sprinters sitting up there, but they they, they get to about. 70 meters, and you know who I'm talking about. He sits back, he starts, his, his hands start beating his chest, and then he gets run down. He should be running 975, 971. Um, and um, I just watched him. I'm like, hmm. Oh, and by the way, I did try to get him. <laughs> and Daryl wanted to give him to me, but he didn't want to leave. And I understand that. But I, was, I love him, but I still want him. If he said, hey, I want yes, before he can get out of his house. <laughs> <laughs> that would be yeah. an adversary. That would be someone he could run with, uh, um, uh, um, Coleman. He's one yeah. of the few that can run with me. He runs fast. He runs 983, but he has the worst technique out of all of them out there. Well. Um, what's excited me the most is nuances, essence, and principles of everything that you've said throughout the last give or take hour. 
uh, the three other tiles have alluded to or said verbatim. So not that your, your umbrella coverage is felt. Your tree is way larger than you, you could ever imagine. And the things that you have said, I've heard and I say, and this is my first time interacting with you. So like the leaves, the branches, the trunk, everything. If you didn't know this already, far outreached than your, your conceptual that you can be under, that you can understand. So I need to say that to you. And oh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I appreciate you. We appreciate your presence. Um, we will let you allow or enjoy the rest of your evening because uh, we will go on forever if we don't, <laughs> because <laughs> we, we can keep talking to you forever and, and we'll have to make this an, another time thing for sure. Oh, um, please. Yes. Please. Oh, this don't is, threaten us with a good time. Yeah, this, this, is, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is what I do. And uh, I know somebody said, well, how come you don't do something else? That's it. Uh, you don't ask a cat to be a dog. <laughs> you know, uh, you don't ask, you don't ask, uh, Otto Bolin always had two things. He said, sheep don't make goat and a, and a monkey know what tree to climb. And I know what lane I'm in and I stay there <laughs> and I keep my eye going forward. And then, you know, when people want to know something, all you do is ask me because I tell them, I, say, I will empty my cup. And they say, well, you know, yeah, do I walk through the valley, shadow of death? my cup run it over. Well, I'm gonna pour my cup out into your mind and your brain because I wanna fill it back up with some knowledge of something that does not exist. And the only way you can do that is you gotta be humble and you gotta like stay in your lane and know uh, that there's, there's more out there to come, much more. And it's up to us to figure out who's gonna be the next one and how are we going to get it done and then support each other and, and so forth and, 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 and just, just keep people, just respect people, respect yourself, and the game will go on. I love it. That's, that's, that's quotable right there. I'm sure somebody will take that quote. Oh, by the way, Miles, I am going to live forever. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. Hey, well, I'm Coach, working on a hundred, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Coach, enjoy the rest of your evening. Well, I'll talk again soon, but um, I'm sure the three gentlemen will be talking to you even sooner than that. So oh, thank absolutely. you so much. Thank you. Kyle. Have a great night. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank all of y'all. Good night. Nice seeing you a while, Huff and Puff. Nice seeing <laughs> your face, baby. <laughs> Same here, my man. Same here. <laughs> All right. All right. Bye. Night. Got it. Got it. Got it. So I, so. I want to tell you, I, I'm, I wanted to tell you all something. When I was an athlete, um, my life circumstances put me uh, training at UCLA uh, during the Thanksgiving and Christmas, Christmas times. Uh, as my satellite training facility for when I, when I wasn't in my home track. And my goal at every Thanksgiving and Christmas time at practice was to do something that would get him to say, well, that's not too bad. <laughs> and that didn't suck. <laughs> like, like literally that was, I felt like I was prepared to be a nine, eight guy when, when he said, you actually can accelerate a little bit. Why, <laughs> why thank you. I've been killing myself to do this. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I love it. That was a great conversation. Um, to make sure that we don't go too far off our rails and stay in our lane. Let's bring back some per usual conversation uh, to wrap up the show tonight. Um, you know, this is per Lamar's verbiage, but sir, please stop putting the quarters in the carousel. I, I mean, somebody has got, somebody, somebody went and changed the 50 for five, five $10 rolls of quarters. And it's just feeding the meter. Like, look, it, we all know that the, the, the coaching carousel trickles down from power five down. It always happens that way, right? So here's my issue. You still got 
power five sprint job open at North Carolina. You still got power five throws jobs open. Um, those jobs being filled are going to put more money in the meter, right? We still got a head coaching job at, at uh, New Mexico State. That is going to put more money in the meter. Folks, it is about to be October. And no end in sight. And no <laughs> end in so, uh, Listen, somebody's going to get a track and field job after, Jeff, after January 1st. Mark my words. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, somebody, some, somebody's going to transfer in at the semester <clears throat> with the kids. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, why are you playing? Right. <laughs> right. So right. some coach is going to be in the transfer portal and land at another school on January 12th. The transfer portal. So somebody is plotting that right now. You know they yeah. are. I, I mean, I think for the this kids. out. We all go. Right. I see you in there. Let's go. <laughs> oh my That's goodness. Crazy. Yeah. Um just anybody who's recently got a job, we're not ignoring you. But we're trying to take the coins out of people's hands. So congratulations to everybody, you know. Clyde here has got two notables that he just got, or plus one from last week that that are now official. Oh yeah, um, I did kind of contribute to this mess, didn't I? You yeah. sure did, because now there's another. Oh, there's so, two openings. That's right. For so, you. Uh, so yeah, we uh, Tyron Harris, <laughs> TJ, my man, has arrived on, on the West Coast to, to coordinate my field events. <laughs> so somebody call up Campbell University. There's some opening. Yeah, yeah. There's right. open wings at Campbell, right? Yes. I think there's a throws position now at, at Maryland. Um, yes. I think that, uh, I think the sprint position, I think it's going to be filled soon at Alabama State. I don't know if it's been officially filled yet. Mm. I'm not sure uh, what's happening with the sprint position at Maryland, not at Maryland, but at, well, I think Garfield Owens at Maryland now. Not sure what's happening at uh, Virginia with that position yet. So, well, how about the sprint position in North Carolina that was just vacated by the new head coach at Ball State? Yeah. <laughs> hey, you you threw you threw a good one out there. I'm 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 very what Richie Bean has up his sleeve at Alabama State. Yes. I'm very interested in that. Yeah, if, he gets, if he gets he what he's after, that thing. will be good, won't it? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. <laughs> we're not we're, we're gonna tease y'all with that one and let leave it right there because Richie is up to something at Alabama. New State. New, new track, finally. Mm -hmm. Yes. And 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 this is so off topic, but I'm I'm I've said it in, on the internet. I'm gonna have to say it publicly to my former administrators at Alabama State. So proud that Richie Bean is finally getting the track that he deserves. It needs to be named after him. Make it happen. Mm hmm. Yeah. Don't wait. Don't make him wait for the retirement. No. Yeah. Do it, no. do it now. And yeah. just get it done. I feel, I feel like no one would contest that. There's, no, there's nothing to no do one in their right mind would. So just I feel like it. the contestion would be if you named it something else. Oh, there will be contesting if, it, if I'm, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, congratulations to those who have recently signed a contract and, and got it approved. And to those coming up, man, everyone's sitting on the wire. I mean, so like you, you all spoke of the trickle down, like, and I, I am probably helping some of that trickle down getting filled and I'm sitting here like, it's the end of September, goodness gracious, and bless their hearts because they're still going after them to, with tenacity. So, like, so we can now call you the queen maker, huh? Oh my goodness. Stop oh, it. yes. <laughs> hey, yes. Hey. There you go. Well played. Um, Duly yeah. noted. I love it. That is hilarious. It is. See, I mean, see how you change up when you, when you uh, land in ooh. the P, whatever y'all call that thing out there now? <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. Anyways, um, I'm glad you actually just opened your mouth because now we're going to go ahead and let you just keep it going. Me? with yes sir because i'm just gonna lob this in the air and just give you three letters c f b college football Man. talk about it sir talk about it i mean I, i'd much rather hear my colleagues on this subject right about now i mean all, you, all the action you've got to do this is down south 
right? That's what they say. I, I'm just theory, he just did it. He just did it. They, he just did this. <laughs> there doesn't appear to there doesn't appear to be any offense in, in in any of the major schools anymore, except Alabama and Florida decided to play offense, and and, and but not at the same time. So like right. Alabama played played a half, <laughs> and then Florida played almost a half, and Alabama won by a little bit. But other than that, all the all of these supposed pretenders to the throne. Notre Dame has no offense. Clemson has no offense. Florida State has no football team. Um, <laughs> I mean, Shots like, fired. <laughs> like we can go on and on and on, right? Like, okay. See, I I think that did anybody in Florida win a football game this weekend? Uh, no, very few. The very few lost. actually played some concept of football. I, I was actually I was I was impressed with the Gators uh, fight, you know, against Alabama. It's a lot closer than people thought. Um, not too sure what that play call was uh, near the goal line. I, I don't I don't understand. <laughs> L- uh, listen, I don't remember who was actually talking about it on the TV, but it's just they they were so right. Like I understand we're in this new era of you know, cute by by too much offense and all this stuff like. The ball's on the one yard line. If you can't get a yard, like just going that way, you don't deserve to win the game. Stop throwing these fades. The quarterbacks aren't skilled enough. The receivers have no concept of space. They just, it looks like they just, the ball just goes three feet out of bounds. Like stop with the fade, stop with the, with the shotgun read options. People like just, just, it's a yard. Like the world told the Seattle Seahawks when they had Marshawn Lynch, yeah. run the ball, run the ball. Pete. Yeah, run what the happened, ball. What happened to Woody Hayes three yards in a cloud of dust, right? What happened? I mean, you can't do it all game. I get that. But you can do it on the goal line. Yeah. Right? Like, I, I don't get well, it. But anyway. And I, I, when, I, when I think about what's going on in college football right now, it's just, it's just a confusing mess. Because all the, the powers that so-called be, they're like, Nobody's playing either. Either the powers aren't the powers, or the or the people that are not supposed that are supposed to be the also rands are a lot better than they're than they're supposed to be. You know, like you know, I was I was so happy to see Oklahoma and Nebraska playing because I mean that used to be one of the big time rivalries back in the day. Very boring football game, you know, which which Nebraska almost won somehow, right? So um, Michigan, not that I'm ever going to be a Michigan fan, but Michigan football should be better. And they're not playing very well with football right now. You know, um, not sure. I have no clue what's going on with Tallahassee. That is the most baffling thing to any of us. And obviously, nobody in Gainesville is rooting for Florida State to be the best football team in the country. But we also, nobody's really rooting for them to be that bad, I don't think, anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's just, that's just not good. And like I said, I'm not sure that. I have to Wait, go didn't they lose to a Florida school? I don't know who they lost to. That's not really lost. Didn't they lose to Jacksonville State? Jacksonville State's not in Jack. That, that's in, they're in like North Carolina, Alabama, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, got it. The Jacksonville University's in Florida. Jacksonville State's not in Florida. Yeah, but that but that was last week. They lost to somebody else this week. Yeah, they lost to somebody else. Trash this week. Yeah. So sure what, what what Sir Lucius is describing there is my favorite thing: chaos, chaos. <laughs> and that's that's where we are. It's you know it's. Three weeks in, it's way too early to have any kind of real sense of anything. But I'll say this, Alabama aside, uh, none of these people are spectacular. Not a one. None. Not a one. Not a one. I don't want to hear about Georgia. I don't want to hear about Oklahoma. I don't, Iowa is not real. Okay? Like, I don't. I don't want to hear about any of this. Uh, no, 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 no. Notre Dame is the most fugazi three and zero in the country. But they're always this. Like we we know Notre Dame is going to finish the season ten and one, get in the get in get in the playoff, and get blown out. Like we already know that's going to happen. So all like I'm saying in the playoff, is get blown out. <laughs> this right now at this point of the season, more than any other year that I can remember in recent times, there's so many pretenders. Like it's all pretenders. You can't tell me that Coastal Carolina at three and zero 
is so much worse or better than Texas A&M at 3-0. and Because Texas A&M ain't impressive. Okay? Like, so I'm just sitting back. I'm enjoying the chaos. I'm enjoying some of the games, the ones that are interesting. And, you know, I'm a West Coast kid. I'm an SEC, SEC grad. You know, people are starting to send me messages. Messages. Oh, what about Oregon? I'm like, look, I'm I'm happy to see Oregon at number three, but we all know you can't go undefeated in the Pac-12. It never happens. So they're going to lose a game that they're not supposed to lose. Magically, someone goes undefeated in the SEC every year. So, you know, we know they're going to have somebody undefeated, but you're not going undefeated in the Pac-12. So Oregon will lose to Washington State or something because it'll just happen. So it's it's a big chaotic mess i i root for the small guys so let's go cincinnati let's go coastal carolina uh who who else looks good not not, not much of anybody uh <laughs> michigan's three and oh don't believe all of that like let that hype go <laughs> <laughs> you know what you, you ucla in typical ucla fashion you beat lsu you lost to fresno state of course you did. Of course they you wore did. that one hard. Of course you wear did. it. So and that's you know. and see that I think that's the challenge for my Gators as well. Like we phenomenal game, but can we bring that intensity every weekend and find a way to win the rest of our games and then show up in Atlanta with a for a rematch with Alabama on a neutral field? That's the, that's that is the charge for our Gators because that that was a very um, impressive performance. But we got to be that team every weekend. We just can't show up for that. Let's be done. Oh, wait, I got to ask Lamar a question because it just rung in my brain because he called Notre Dame the most fugazi of the 3-0 and teams. Sir, Arkansas is 3-0. Uh, listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> listen, Linda, I'm listen. Me. <laughs> listen, Linda, listen. Notre Dame cannot score it's a problem <laughs> they scored 21 points i believe against a truly overrated 2 and 0 purdue team notre dame is not good they're gonna lose to clemson like six to three. <laughs> oh my god because neither team can score i'm actually i'm actually quite shocked at how bad Clemson looks on offense. I, I don't it's, understand it's Clemson's offense shocking. being bad at all. It makes no – like, their offense is nothing but five-star dudes. Their quarterback was literally the Heisman favorite before the season started, and they they can't score against air right now. Yikes. Hey, man. I, anyway. Chaos, baby. I love it. Chaos is, is, a, is upon us. Dear. There's no question about it. I love it. So, we'll go ahead and end the chaos. And I'll stir the individual pot, excuse me, of Lamar's because he is in line for rapid fire. Oh boy. There you go. I think this one's fun. I was I thought they were fun. <laughs> All right. I know it's you got enough battery in your car to make it through these these questions, sir. Car, yes. We'll see about phone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, got you. I'll rapid fire, literally. Um all right. Did you think JS was going to drop an F bomb? No. Got it. JS, <laughs> we, we got JS close, is <laughs> has always been uh, classy and smooth. So no. Got it. All righty. Um, what is your favorite model of any minivan? Zero. <laughs> what well, you know? You all, drove them for the, all, went for team trips. That's why all minivans should be banned from from the vehicle world. Oh my gosh. They're oh terrible. Gosh. They're terrible vehicles. They're absolutely terrible. Anyways, I don't have a minivan. I'm just saying I do have a favorite whenever we're recruiting or, or traveling. So anyways, um, I asked Sir Lewis just last week. I've asked Clyde this or weeks before. Um, what about you? Does pineapple belong on pizza? No. Oh my god! But, but but here's what I'll say: It doesn't belong on pizza, but it doesn't taste anywhere near as bad as people say that it does. Like I will eat it. 
but it doesn't yeah. belong on pizza. I have to break up all of our friendships, gentlemen, just to let you know. Um, and, I, and I will say this, just to be honest, <laughs> the only time that pineapple is even remotely acceptable on pizza is if it's Hawaiian and it has pineapple and ham. If it has pineapple and other things, you need to be slapped. So you ain't Moving on. nothing. You're the one in the corner looking weird by yourself. I know, but that means I get all the pineapple pizza, so I'm good. <laughs> so, so you should be happy, yes. I am. Um, oh, all right, ice cream. Or do you pick cookies and cream, mint chocolate chip, or pralines and cream? Pralines and cream. Done. Got it. 100% ever, of the time. Have you ever walked out of Target with just one item? No. I've either walked out of Target <laughs> with no items or a bag. Or two. Um, honey Nut Cheerios or Frosted Flakes? Honey Nut Cheerios. I'm just saying, can you tell I was hungry when I wrote these? Um, <laughs> whoa, what's your favorite Sour Patch Kid, the red or the blue? Blue. Got it. Um, that is it. I have to make sure that your phone stays alive long enough for us to find you. Oh, <laughs> We're good. It might be in the but, yeah. softest rapid fire ever. I know. It, it was relatively re relatively calm. I appreciate it. A lot okay, of food. Was, All right. It so, was. So I was hungry. I, so I, I'm gonna add you. I'm gonna add you a good one in, in lieu of our of our esteemed legendary guest. Most overrated and most underrated John Smith athlete. Ooh. Ooh. Uh. Uh, the easy one is underrated. Uh, it's Danny Everett. Danny Everett was a true blue, absolute monster. And bad people birthday. just don't. Bad bad, birthday. Horrible birthday. Dude ran sub 20 and sub 44 and, and, and beat Steve Lewis every time he raced him that year, except the, except the Olympics. So anyway, um, most overrated. Ooh. Um, maybe this isn't fair, but I because because I really like the person, so it's going to sound like I'm being mean, but I I never got the hype about Antoine Maybank. Like, like it's not a disc because he ran 44 seconds and he jumped 27 feet, I think. I think that's what the double was, like, that nobody else had ever done. But yeah, I 27 was, like, was before he went to John. Right. right. But, but, like, that was, you know, they always got to give you something to, to hype about, right? But I just, of all the quarter mile, all the great quarter milers John's ever had, he's definitely the worst. And when mm -hmm. I say worst, meaning, like, if you look at his talent ceiling and where he got to, he's definitely the furthest. From from what his talent ceiling was. Fair enough. I like it. Wow. Not a dis not a diss of him though, but just answering the question. Leave it to Clyde to stir the petty pot. For sure. <laughs> for sure. I knew it was coming, so I was prepared. This is a great question. So so I'm gonna make this fairly simple because I, I how do you follow that? Right. Um so like if you had one piece of advice for an income college freshman, just one thing you they need to do, what would it be? Um, trust your coach. I mean, see how easy that was, Clyde. You signed the paper and everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's you know. You, you know I, I had I had this conversation one time uh, with an athlete after I had had the conversation with Sir Lucius and I and and the, the conversation kind of went like this. You had all the schools in the entire country to pick from and you chose to come here and you chose to come here because you knew that I was going to coach you. So why when you get here, do you want to argue with me? I mean, and I got that from a conversation that I had with Sir Lucius because he was having a conversation with one of his athletes, like going back and forth. And I asked the question, if they could have gone anywhere on the planet and they picked your school, why they get there to argue with you? And then he said, you know, that's a good point. So then 
two days later, I had a similar conversation with an athlete and I just laid it on him. It's like, why'd you come here? If you want to, if you want to argue with everything I tell you to do. That sentence is going to be questioned or asked like a billion times in the next two weeks. Because it's a real transition. question. Yeah, but we're going to transition as coaches into our twenty-hour care weeks, and and this is when the real work starts. And athletes are going to have words to say because now they're like they thought the fall was hard. Well, now we get more time with you, and you think it's going to be easier? Like you're just not going to like it even more. It may not be more contact, but it's going to be more focused, and you're going to argue. And we're going to be like, so why'd you come? Guess what? You I, I mean, a one-time I, transfer. <laughs> you go. <laughs> I, I, I was notoriously, uh, I, was, I, I had a notoriously tough fall. And I used to always tell the groups, you can hate me in the fall and love me in the spring, or you can love me in the fall and hate me in the spring. Fall is going to be brutal so this spring you can win. If your fall, if your fall is not very tough, you're going to get your face punched in in the spring. And then I'm gonna leave you home. Yep. Hate me now, love me in March, May, and June. Yep. Thanks. Love it. Well, speaking about love, let's let's give out some love. We've got tons of that to give. So <laughs> oh, let, I want to go let's... first. Oh, geez. Cry many. Go Jump ahead. through the screen, why don't you? <laughs> I know. Oh, God. Hey, I, mine, mine is really, really easy. Uh, and this person doesn't watch the show, but um, my, uh, my, my sister, not by birth, but that doesn't matter. My sister had a, uh, they, they found a, um, a malignant deal in, in one of her breasts and she had a successful uh, mastectomy today and she's doing well post-op and I want to send all of my flowers to one Miss Hadia Wadud. Awesome. Happy healing. Happy, Happy healing. healing. Yeah, I'll, I'll go. Um, it, it has been a rough couple of months for me. Lost some, some family and friends and um, lost a couple more this week. So I just want to give my heartbeat props to all of my family, people on these tiles included. Love you all. Um, we, none of us knows what tomorrow is going to bring. So I encourage everybody to reach out to those you love, let them know you love them, hug them, love on them while you can. And I want to thank all of you for being a part of my life and helping raise me up to be the person that I am. I'll, uh, I'll stick with the short and uh, to the point family issue. Um, three words, Tiana Tashel Madison is back in school officially with the Tennessee Vols. I'm gonna finish her degree, something she's been wanting to do a long time. Couldn't be prouder of you, kid. Keep doing your thing. Love that. Super awesome. I every time I've opened social media and seeing her glip, her lips, I'm just like, oh man, that's so exciting. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine the smile every morning. So that's awesome for her. Um, I have to give my heartbeat props to Mr. Lamont Johnson, which I'm sure everybody <laughs> that face is what I was waiting for. Um, <laughs> um, uh, we had a coach's social last night and he took me by surprise with some of the words that he shared to me about me. Um, I don't take words very well in compliment form. Uh, I, I can receive negative all day because I will fight back all that. But uh, receiving positive words and the things that he said in regards to how I helped him personally. And uh, he spoke for some other coaches about um, what I was able to do during COVID and even post COVID. And I appreciate that because I'm not sure why I wasn't able to hear those things before, but last night for some reason I heard them and I heard you loud and clear. So, sir, I appreciate you. I appreciate you being vulnerable enough to lift me up and, and help me hear those things. Um, and uh, good stuff, sir. I don't know. I, like, like you said, I don't even remember when we met, but I appreciate your presence and I look forward to the continued presence of 
you and all your ruckus. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think there's a better word for that, just ruckus. That, that was perfect. Right. Yeah, Mont Johnson and all his ruckus. Yes. Yeah. So um, with that being said, Jacksonville State is in Alabama. They are in the Ohio Valley Conference. And uh, yeah, wow. We won't revisit that. I just had to solidify that note there for you. Yikes, getting beat by the OVC. Man, I don't know about that one. But anyhow, gentlemen, this was... So for the record, all you FSU fans, it was the Big 12 dog and y'all, not the SEC. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. The little 12. <laughs> little 12. Hey, wait, we were in the medium 12 last week. So. I was going to say, they're, I they're the medium 12. But then the, <laughs> but then the football games happened. So oh, they shrunk. Goodness. Stop <laughs> it. Anyways, on that Shots note, I'm cutting us off. I'm cutting us off. Um, How did everyone, you shriek over the weekend? That's what we thinking. didn't. We didn't. Um, have a great week. Have a great weekend. <laughs> be blessed. Be safe. Make good decisions. And we'll see each other soon. Bye, everybody. When the lights come on, the road just get to running. When the lights come on, the opponents smash the plumbing. Would you like it warm, hot, knife the butter? Truth pin them hard, knock them off that rebuttal. Tsunami, tidal wave to your puddle. Tough love, punch when the arms, little brothers. Athletics double, I'll see it, there's no others. Track the field's pace and we'll peel to go further. Hey, Wiley, Coyote, it's road runners. Feels like you know us, you've been with us the whole summer. If not for this quarantine, these four corners wouldn't be here, but we're here, so start learning. You gotta earn your stripes, gotta get your scars. Show you how to fight, but show us who you are. You lack experience, but still you wanna talk. And who is actually talking to your circle's kinda small. Heads prevail when the backbone's strong. Gotta keep it coming, no, it won't last long. Pass a failed and sell the sad song. And if you don't check yourself, then that's wrong. Just trying to give you the real that you asked for. So why you keep cutting us off to ask more? We put it in slow mo, but you fast forward. Athletics, devil, I'll see the task force.